Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. It is supposed to be really, really nice today. Yeah. Mm. So if you have the opportunity, go ahead and get outside and enjoy the weather. Uh, unusual for the end of February and as we get ready to go into March. Uh, also, that, so I'm wondering if that lion's going to come out the end of March. She's going to fall. Yeah. We'll see. Girls basketball week. Yeah, there you go. There Girls you basketball go. week. That's notorious. Week. Well, if you are joining us online, please let us know that you're with us just by giving us a hello in the comments. Uh, we'd love to see who all is joining us this morning, uh, both in person and online. Uh, this Wednesday, uh, we well, today we kind of kick off a busy week with uh, the My God, My God, Why Have You Forsaken Me sermon today that Mark has been given by God. And we will continue the Bible study on Wednesday at 7, uh, going a little deeper into the sermon uh, from today. So join us for that and also for a time of prayer. Next Saturday, the men will be not, will be not, that doesn't just sound right. How about we back up? Next week, we do not have men's breakfast. Instead, we will be at the Iron Sharpens Iron Conference in Davenport uh, here in the next couple of days. We will get a timeline because we're going to just make a tour of it and pick everybody up on the way to leave. So, Denny, you're the last one, so you have to get up the uh, latest, latest of everybody. Oh, everybody else has to get up a little don't earlier. Don't worry about it. But uh, we'll be enjoying a day of fellowship with other men and just getting into the Word. So we look forward to that. And then the following Saturday, we kick off season, or continue season 19 with our second race, uh, March 9th. There's only one problem with that day. We go to bed that night. <laughs> Everybody's favorite time of the year. Uh -oh. We get to spring forward. I almost forgot about that, and it's only two weeks out, so we had to slip that into the announcements this morning just to remind everybody. We'll remind you again next week, uh, but don't forget about that. But the following weekend, we get to have some fun. So we'll be coming together for our Grace Street Cinema showing of Finding Normal. Uh, doors open at 5.30 with the uh, movie at 6. Concessions, as always, while they last, got to put that little disclaimer out there, while they last, our free hot dogs, brownie bites, popcorn, drinks. So be sure to join us for that. And if you need a ride, just let us know so that we can get you picked up and brought. Uh, movie is a great movie about a doctor who is driving across country to meet up with her boyfriend to start a clinic. And she gets stuck in normal North Carolina because, well, she didn't pay her parking tickets. And her credit card didn't work and her phone doesn't work. So she has to do community service and gets a little inkling of what God has for her. So join us for that. Uh, for those of you watching online, the link will be going up in the uh, comments section of the video this morning with our worship music. So uh, be sure to worship with that music after the service today. And that pretty much covers everything for right now. So let's go to God the Word of God. Father God, we just thank you that no matter what we're going through, that you are there. That we could be in our deepest trial, yet you are there. And Father, although we might not be able to see it with the lens we're looking through at the time, you are there. And you are guiding and directing. And you are leading us through. And that you will show us what you need what you want us to do. Help us to have eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to follow through. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 22, verses 1 and 2, and in this it says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far away when I groan for help? Every day I call to you, my God, but you do not answer. Every night I lift my voice, but I find no relief. Now, this is most generally associated to Jesus on the cross. But David said this hundreds of years before. In a, a trial of his own that he was going through. But yet he gives a very accurate description of what Jesus would endure on the cross. 
David is obviously going through a very deep distress. And it's a distress that we've all at some point or another probably faced. Maybe a different situation, but still a distress. And it's a distress that we didn't receive any relief. Or we haven't seen answers to God's prayers. You know, these aches and pains. I know Mark has been wanting that need to function better sooner, but it will in time. I know I've gone through things and wondered when. I mean, 40 years of sleep apnea before I got this little jewel that helps me sleep at night. We all go through some suffering. But in this instance, like the Messiah, David, through his suffering, will get his victory. As Jesus cries out to God from the cross, it comes as an urgent appeal. He's not crying out because of doubt. It's an urgent appeal to God. It's not doubt. Acting in faith is doing something even when it doesn't feel like it's right. God, please heal this, or please heal that, or why am I going through this? But God, I have faith that you will take me through it. It's doing it basically because we believe because God said so. Moses, take the people out of Israel or out of Egypt and take them to the promised land. Abraham, I want you to leave your family and go to this, this land that you don't know where it's at. Just do what I tell you to do. Doing it out of faith. And while David felt some abandonment from God, nothing to what Jesus would have felt on the cross. This is what Jesus was expressing on the cross, this deep, deep sense of divine abandonment. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Father, as we uh, get ready to hear the message that you have given to Pastor Mark, we just thank you. We thank you for all the many blessings in our lives. And again, Father, whenever we're going through something, even if we can't see you or hear you as we go through it, Father, we walk by faith. Thank you for giving us the word that you have prepared this morning through Mark. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Good morning, church. Good morning. What a beautiful day outside. Sun shining. It's going to be nice and warm today. Um, you know, that's the one thing about Iowa weather is it's, it's always very unpredictable. So we never know what we're going to get. It's kind of like that uh, uh, good old story of Forrest Gump out there. It's, you know, the Iowa weather's like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get until you bite into it. But anyway, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We have a lot of things to be happy about. There's a lot of bad stuff in the world, and it always brings us down. But, you know, when we take a look at this day, we look at the blessings that God gives us each and every day. And once we recognize those and take them to heart, it brings joy into our life. So we have something to rejoice about. So today, I mean, this is a pretty pretty uh, solemn thing that we're talking about here is Jesus on the cross. So this whole Lenten series that we're going through is seven words from the cross. And obviously it's not just seven words, but it's seven different phrases that Jesus spoke from the cross. So today uh, the, the message is Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani in Aramaic, Aramaic, which means my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And those words that were uttered by Jesus on the cross might be the most misunderstood 
words that came from the cross that day. Now, what I mean by that is some of the people will think that he was calling out to his Father in heaven, feeling abandoned. And others have said that it is when he became fully human, and in his humanness is when he took on the full weight of the sins of all mankind. And he was feeling very distressed. And yet there was others in the bystanders in there that hearing it said, he is calling out for Elijah to come and save him. But others say he was just quoting scripture. Oh, I'm going to have to sit down. I thought maybe I could stand for a while, but not so much. So there was a lot of misunderstanding about what it could be. And it could be a, a number of things that were being said. Now, for those who were Jewish in there, who had been through the tabernacle, who had been through temple, he would have heard those words, those scriptures. And Jesus, as he was in the, the temple, would have heard these being read from the scrolls of Psalm 22 that David had written. But what it is, is it's, a, it's all of one thing. And that is, why have thou forsaken me? God forsaken. You ever hear that term before? See, it usually refers to uh, a place that you really don't want to be in, whether it's physically or mentally. And Webster defines it as a remote, desolate, or neglected, miserable in appearance or of circumstance. And so that kind of paints this picture of a place you really don't want to be in. <coughs> And it can also be referred to as abandoned. That's a synonym for it, is abandoned. It's a term that can be used to uh, describe a person, a place, or a thing. And it could be either physically or mentally, or a combination of both. But today, what I want you guys to think of is more of a personal meaning, a state of mind, if you will, a very strong emotion. Have you ever been there? Have you ever thought that God had forsaken you? God had abandoned you? Have you ever called out to God in desperation? God, are you even there? Do you hear me, God? Do you even care? Do you even answer prayers anymore? These are cries of desperation, frustration, feeling left out, abandoned, and yeah, sometimes maybe even betrayed. Yep, been there, done that. I felt this many, many times. I've cried out to God many, many times in my life when I was going through some really tough times. And I think for most of us here, we've all had many or at least some of these emotions at one point in time these questions, these frustrations, at least once in our life, if not numbers of times. So it's something that should speak to our heart today. We should be able to, to really empathize and, and join in with Jesus as he's saying these words to God. Why have you abandoned me? Why have you forsaken me? Why have you left me here on my own? Or so it seems. So I've been through some really tough times in my life where I felt God had turned his back on me and just stopped answering prayers. I felt forsaken. And I struggled with this. And one of the motions that tends to bring itself up to the surface in the midst of all this stuff going on is resentment. You resent the fact that God is not answering your prayers. And then you start questioning yourself. Am I good enough? Did I mess up so bad that God has just left me to sit down there? As Casting Crown said in one of their songs, I feel like I'm just one mistake away for you leaving me this way. God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you forsaken me? And this is a place that you don't want to stay in. You don't want to stay in that place mentally. It's a very, very dark place to be in in your life. So I sought advice from my pastor, and we discussed it and prayed over the situation, and the prayers were answered. Now, I will say this, in due time, everything began to fall in place. But see, 
one of the things was, God was there the whole time. But I wasn't really letting God do his work. I was too focused on the situation to see that God was working in the middle of it. God didn't abandon me. He hadn't forsaken me. Although that's the way I felt because that's the way I, that's the only way that I could see what was going on. See, I found out that by going through these things, it really came down to a matter or perspective. In reality, God hadn't really abandoned me, but it was something I needed to go through in order to grow spiritually in my relationship with God. If I hadn't broken down and prayed and prayed hard over and over and over again. But moreover, what the really important thing is, we've got to take time to listen for God's response or to see God's response to those prayers. And a lot of times we want that instant gratification. That's what this whole society is like today. We want an instant gratification. We don't want to wait for God to answer the prayer or to open our eyes and understand and see the blessings that he's put in our way and the people that he's put in our path to help us through the situation. A lot of us tend to blow those people off. So as I was going through it, it was really, really, really hard to see. It didn't seem like at the time that God was with me. But it was ultimately for my own good that I had to go through it. I had to learn and grow through that circumstance. And Terry and I both have had the same experiences. It's, it's amazing to see the parallels in, in his life and my life when we talk about things and as we've gotten to know each other over the years here. But we, we had the same experience of our ex-wives taking our children and leaving with the kids out of state. And we didn't know where they went. We didn't know when they were going to be back. And it was a point where we didn't know if and when we were going to see our children again. Now, as parents, I think you can probably imagine, that's a horrible thing to have to go through. And if you're not a parent, it's a horrible thing that you have to go through. It was a terrible thing. And for me at the time, I don't want to speak for Terry, but it was a God-forsaken experience. And I kept saying, what could possibly come from this? What good can come from this? Well, they did return, and things did work out. But at the time, in the moment, it seemed as though my world was coming to an end. It was ending. Because... My kids were my whole life at that point in time. I had just gone through uh, having to have my knee reconstructed. And I used to play ball. I was very active, did a lot of things like that. And because I had to have my knee reconstructed, I couldn't run anymore. I couldn't play ball anymore. I couldn't do anything. I had to learn how to walk again because my nerves got cut and I had no feeling from the knee down. And so I had to learn how to start all over in my life. And there was a whole string of things that I went through, and I thought God had abandoned me in the process of it all. And so it was a very hard time in my life, and it was a very dark time in my life. And as I was going through these things, and, and, and divorce came out of this whole thing as, as part of some of the things that played out, and I was, a, I was in charge, I was the worship leader in church, and I was in charge of, uh, you know, the whole services, and, and I was the chairman of the worship committee. And I was teaching Sunday school classes, and I was working with uh, the youth and the youth program, and I was very, very connected, and church was a huge part of my life. And the pastor at that time, he came in, and because and, I went in and told him, I said, well, I'm... I'm going to have to go through, and my wife and I are getting divorced. And so within a week, I was no longer doing anything in the church. He cut me out completely. At the point in time, I needed the church the most. They abandoned me because I was going through a divorce. So when I needed God and I needed the people of God the most, I felt abandoned. Rejected. Sorry. It's 
still to this day, oh God, forsake me. It's what I needed. I needed the baby of God. I needed that love to fulfill that point in my life. Well, God did work through all that. Things started to change in my life. I actually started up a new career. I, when I said everything changed, everything changed. And God brought me Lori a couple years later. In due time. In due time. I did a lot of praying, but I didn't get the answer I was looking for when I wanted the answer. And we tend to live our lives expectantly. And by that I mean we want things to follow our plan and in our timeline. But see, we gotta, we got to wake up to the bigger picture that's going on around us. And sometimes it's just not possible that we see that bigger picture. And we end up going down a very dark path. But in my experience, through all that I've been through in my life, God never abandons us. But we are so focused on our situation that we fail to see that God is right there in it with us. And I mean in it with us. So there's a story I'd like to share today that pretty much kind of sums it all up. And it's all about failing to answer the call of the rescuer. So did you know that you could get a cell phone call a cell phone signal on the highest mountain in Colorado. And if you get lost hiking that mountain, you should probably answer your phone even if you don't recognize the caller's number. Now, the rest of the story. Well, see, that's the message that's being spread by the Lake County Search and Rescue, which tried to help a lost hiker in the Colorado mountains on Mount Elbert by sending out search teams and repeatedly calling the hiker's phone, but to no avail. The hiker spent the night on the side of the mountain before finally reaching safety. And one notable takeaway is that the subject ignored repeated calls from us because he didn't recognize the number. The hiker said at about 9 a.m. on route to a, on a hike that would normally take about seven hours to complete round trip. And a caller alerted the search and rescue teams about 8 o'clock p.m. that he had not returned yet. And a five-person team stayed out searching for him in the field, looking for that hiker until 3 a.m. When the team suspended the search, finally. More searchers hit the mountain the next morning, but then the hiker appeared. Having finally made it back to their car. The hiker guy had gotten disoriented in an ordeal that lasted about 24 hours. It ended all right, but it could have had a very different, devastating outcome. See, he, if he only heeded the answer that was there before him if he would have answered the call of the rescuers. He would have had a much different result in the end. And sadly, it is sometimes the habit of people to avoid those who are there trying to rescue them. If we go back into the scriptures, God went looking for Adam and Eve in the garden when they were hiding from him in fear. Genesis 3, 9. Jesus came to earth to seek and save the lost. Luke 19, 10. But what happened? They rejected his message. He repeatedly called the lost to come to him for salvation, but they responded refused to respond. Matthew 23, 37 and Luke 13, 34. Over and over again, do you see a pattern that's happening here? The people fail to respond to the call that's being given to them. They can't hear the voice of God trying to talk to them because of the situations that they're in. Now, a lot of us might say, I'm not good enough to respond to God's call. I'm, I'm not worth it. I've done too many bad things in my life. But you know what? God's still there. He's still waiting for you to call out to him. And he will answer the call. 
See, God didn't abandon us. We left him. When we feel lost and abandoned, we need to stop and think, did we listen for God to give us the answer? Did we respond to the call of the rescuer? Or did we follow our own direction? Did we follow the Holy Spirit guiding us through it? The situation that we were in? Did we fail to hear the call of the rescuer because of we were so focused on the situation? Well, see, in most cases, we try and fix it on our own. And when that fails, what do we do? We blame God for a lot for allowing us to get in the mess to start with, right? It's God's fault. We want to blame God when things aren't going our way. So how many times have you heard this? How could a good God allow such things to happen to such good people, right? Well, two words come to mind. That would be free will. We have the choice to turn to God first but instead, we usually end up following our own path. We try and fix it ourselves first. <clears throat> usually, that doesn't have a really great outcome into it. When we look at the situation, is it God who created the mess, or was it simply a culmination of poor choices on our part? Ultimately, who really got us in to the situation that we're in? Guess what? Wasn't God. I'll just give you the spoiler right then and there. So, our words for the day, we, we hear, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So let's go back into our call to worship today, and I invite you to grab your Bibles out and turn to page 409 and 410. So we want to go back to that call to worship this morning and see why Jesus would quote this from the cross. This psalm was written by David, as, as Terry was alluding to, was written by David over a thousand years before Christ even came on the scene. A thousand years before Christ was crucified on the cross. And crucifixion was not even devised yet when David wrote this. So David would not have understood what God had revealed to him when he wrote this as a foretelling of what was to come. David was writing this out of his humanness, from his human perspective, from his human understanding. So let's dive in. Psalms 22, 1. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why are you so far away from me when I groan for help? Every day I call to you, my God, but you do not answer. Every night you hear my voice, but I find no relief. So is this our cry out for help? Is this our cry that we cry to God? David goes on, yet you are holy enthroned on the praises of Israel, our ancestors trusted in you, and you rescued them. They cried out to you and were saved. They trusted in you and were never disgraced. See, in this, David is showing us that he, God, always responds to the call of his people. Always responds. But I am a worm and not a man. I am scorned and despised by all. Everyone who sees me mocks me. They sneer and shake their heads saying, Is this the one who relies on the Lord? Then let the Lord save him. If the Lord loves him so much, let the Lord rescue him. But see, they did not recognize him. They did not respect who he was. Yet you brought me safely from my mother's womb and led me to trust you at my mother's breast. I was thrust into your arms at birth. You have been my God from the moment I was born. Do not stay so far from me, for trouble is near, and no one else can help me. See, God was with us before we were born. He knew you before you were born. He knew the numbers of hairs on your head. Now he's got kind of a dilemma with Steve and I, but 
He knew the number of hairs on our head before we were even born. God's been with us the entire time in our lives. My enemies surround me like a herd of bulls. Fierce bulls of Bashan have hemmed me in. Like lions, they open their jaws against me, roaring and tearing into their prey. If we liken this to Jesus, the Pharisees were against him because he threatened their very existence. He threatened the way they were in life. They threatened their power. Any of that sound familiar? How about the politicians today? No said. My life is poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax melting within me. My strength is dried up like sun-baked clay. My tongue sticks to the roof of his mouth. And in Jesus... His blood flowed from the wounds that were inflicted upon him. By his stripes, the blood, we are healed. By his blood, we are healed. His bones were completely out of joint. What happens when a person is crucified is their heart, they have such a hard time breathing. They die of asphyxiation, typically. But their heart it starts to build up fluid around it. And it's melting like wax. And the heart explodes. You have laid me in the dust and left me for dead. My enemies surround me like a pack of dogs. An evil gang closes in on me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. My enemies stare at me and gloat. They divide my garments among themselves and throw dice for my clothing. Can these words from David from a thousand years before describe anyone else except Christ and what he went through? No, I don't think so. Oh Lord, do not stay far away. You are my strength. Come quickly to my aid. Save me from the sword. Spare my precious life from these dogs. Snatch me from the lion's jaws, from the horns of these wild oxen. And then we take a look at Jesus' ministry. I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. I will praise you among your assembled people. Play, praise the Lord, all you who fear him, honor him. All you descendants of Jacob, show him reverence all you descendants of Israel. For he has not ignored or belittled or suffered the, the suffering of the needy. He has not turned his back on them, but has listened to their cries for help. I will praise you in the great assembly. I will fulfill my vows in the presence of those who worship you. The poor will eat and be satisfied. All who seek the Lord will praise him. Their hearts will rejoice with everlasting joy. The whole earth will acknowledge the Lord and return to him. All the families of the nations will bow down before him. Your royal power belongs to the Lord. He rules all nations. Let the rich of the earth feast and worship. Bow down before him, all who are mortal, all whose lives will end as dust. Our children will also serve him. Future generations will hear about the wonders of the Lord. His righteous acts will be told to those not yet born. And they will hear about everything he has done. So when Jesus uttered those words from the cross, he was reminding those who were there, the Jews that were there, he was reminding him them of the words of David a thousand years before. In Luke 24, 44 through 45, Jesus tells them, Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms, concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. So as he is... <coughs> being nailed to the cross as he is fighting for his very life on the cross. He's fulfilling his words to the disciples. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. 
And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. How many times do we go through and we read the Bible and we don't really comprehend what is written there? This study is really opening up a lot of these things to us. There's a lot more than what is written there. But we have to have our minds opened up. We have to accept the word of God coming into us to have that fulfillment of the relationship that Jesus restored with us and God on the cross. And as we do, that relationship will grow. I had to go through some really bad times in my life in order to grow and, and to understand what God was wanting out of my life. See, and I don't think Jesus gets any more vividly portrayed than in the Psalms in Psalm 22, written a thousand years before he came on the scene. And moreover, we have the very next Psalm on page 410, the 23rd Psalm. Now to me, it tells us of the reverence for God, and I think it very much is a description of the purpose of Jesus on his walk on the earth. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures, and he leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table in the presence of my enemies. And you anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all of the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is an assurance that if we follow God, if we obey God, if we believe in his son Jesus, these things will be brought unto us in our lives. This is a pattern for which we should have this assurance going forward. I read this a lot of times when I'm, when I'm uh, doing a funeral. And I have a whole, oh, oh, I printed them off, they're sitting in the printer at home. Uh, didn't tell me. But I have a full summary of what the 23rd Psalm is and what it means. And what each one of these passages in here speaks to us on. So I think it makes perfect sense that these two Psalms are in here back to back. They portray Jesus as the fulfillment of the prophecies and how his ministry will last forever. We have to understand, we've got to look in there and we have to understand what God is telling us. He's speaking to us in these words of Scripture. He gave those words of Scripture a thousand years before Jesus ever came. You see, God is timeless, though it may seem he's not present in our circumstance with us at the time. And it's because we can't see the whole picture. We can't see the big picture that God has for all of us, for all eternity. So we're just a small part of a much larger picture. Yet, yet, we matter to God so much, he gave us Jesus to prove his love for us, for you, for me, for everyone in the world. And that his plan is great and vast. It spans millennia out here, as you can see by his words. So we must trust in God. And as our relationship with God grows, as our understanding of that relationship, of that redemption that God has done for us, of that renewal, of that restoration, of that salvation. See, we, we have to understand that the cross, it, it represents all of those things because that's what it is for us. It's a renewal, a restoration of our lives. He restores our soul. He tells us in his words. He knew the numbers of hair on our head before we were even born. We must trust in God as our relationship grows. Our part in the plan then will be revealed to us as our relationship with God grows. We have to go through the circumstances in our lives. We have to go through the troubles in our life in order to have a close 
relationship with God. We have to go through the stuff to get to the really good stuff. So he was with Jesus on the cross. God is with us always. He was not abandoned, nor are we abandoned. We need to change our perspective to see that God is with us always in everything, all the time. When we do, our relationship will strengthen. And he will reveal his plan for us, for our lives. Thanks be to God. Amen. 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 Let us pray. Lord God, we come before you today with a humbleness of heart. We've all messed up and fallen short of the glory of God. But the great thing is you assure us that's not where we have to stay. We don't have to stay lost in a lost world. We thank you, Lord God, for your grace, for your mercy, for your unending love, for your forgiveness. We ask today that you would help us be strong in you, strong in our faith that keeps us from falling and brings us into your glory. Restore us, reconcile us, redeem us today, Lord Jesus. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. 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 As we prepare to take communion together this morning. And Jesus is going through the agony that he did in the garden, and then certainly the physical torture and agony that he went through being beaten and on the cross. We all go through a desert time. Jesus went through that at the beginning of, the min of his ministry for 40 days, and then for a short time at the end is culminates it by saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But throughout all of it, he did not give up his faith. We've all been through a desert time. You think of the Israelites going through their desert time, and they forgot that God was there with them. They forgot that he was supplying manna, and eventually the quail, and, and all the things that they truly needed, the water, even Moses got frustrated and hit the rock rather than speaking to it. But we have to remember to follow Jesus' example. And keep the faith. And keep on serving. We've said it many times before. He even washed Jesus' feet. He knew what was about to happen. And he served the disciples. After he had finished washing their feet, and they sat down to share the meal together. He took the bread and he broke it, saying, This is my body given for you. Take and eat. Later in the meal, he took the cup and said, This is the cup, the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. All sin. Each time we see he of this bread and drink of this cup, we need to remember that even when we screw up, even when we're in that desert time, God hasn't forsaken us. He hasn't left us. He has just let us make a mistake and he will guide us through it. The body of Christ broken for you. Take and eat. And the blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink. Heavenly Father, as we share this meal together, we just thank you for all the things that it means. You sent your son to be fully human to take on the sins of the world. So that all the things that 
came before were forgiven. And even when we stumble and even when we fall, Lord, you are still walking there right beside us. Continue to lead us, Father, right into your heavenly arms. In Jesus' name. for the people. And I've been given a few prayers this morning to ask for, for help for people. So is there any any others this morning? Yes, Nick. Um, so one of my roommates, roommates, roommates sorry, I'm staying with, <clears throat> just learned she had um, diabetes. I know oh. she's just going to have a hard time with it because she likes to eat a lot. So sugar and stuff. So. I know, that's hard, isn't it? Yeah, that's great. <laughs> God will be with her. What's her name? Tina. Tina. All right, we'll pray for Tina Thank you. and for help through that. Yes, you're welcome. Anybody else? Yeah. Okay, let's go to prayer. Father God, let the Holy Spirit just reign in this house and be with me as I pray for these people. We come to you this morning giving you praise and honor for all you have done for us. We praise the Holy Spirit for living in us and dwelling among us. We thank you, Jesus, that you gave your life for us that you alone can change hearts and minds to be Christ-like, so we can live lives worthy of you. As it states in Ephesians 5, 1 and 2, be imitators of God, therefore as dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Father God, we lift up Tina, and that she has found out she has diabetes, Lord God. This is hard for a lot of people because they have to change their routine and their habits, Lord, if they're eating. So be with her. Help her to be conscious of everything she eats. Help her to know what is good for her and what is not. Be with her and comfort her through this time and help her to conquer this trial that she is in. And with your love and continued prayer, we, we pray for her, Lord Jesus. Thank you for Tina. Father God, we lift up Dan Britton's family for a praise of a new baby this week, Lacey Knoll. And we thank you for your blessings for this child. And during the time of the, the pregnancy, his grandma passed. And she, <clears throat> we lift him up. We will lift their whole family up, Lord Jesus. And uh, they are struggling with ALS with his dad and the fact that he has a gene that could cause that, Lord Jesus. But you, you are God. You are the great physician. You know the healing power that goes through their bodies. And you can heal all things. So let them know that you are with them. And let them understand that you are God and you will, you will never forsake them or leave them through this trial. Be with his dad as he's going through the ALS and be with him during his time in his final days. Give him courage to make it through and help him to end strong, Lord Jesus, in you. And we praise you and thank you for their family and their lives. Father God, we lift up the family of Mac Goff, for they have lost their father this week, and we just praise, praise you for a life that has been well lived and we just thank you Jesus for this family and we give we ask that you give them courage and hope and um, peace through the time ahead Lord Jesus comfort them in all their all their days ahead and we thank you for his life in Jesus name father we lift up dawn to you this morning and we ask that you remove the Meniere's disease from him it has no place in his body. Therefore, I rebuke it in the name of Jesus. I pray Ephesians 3, 16 over him, that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. In Jesus' name, let it be so. Father God, I lift up Lexi and her children. Please give her guidance and discernment to make good and right choices for herself and her children. 
the Christian people in her path to help guide them in the right direction that you wish them to go. Help them to find you in every circumstance in their lives so that you will lead them to a right relationship with you. And Father God, we lift up Mark and Joe and myself for healing of our limbs. We know that from you, the whole body is joined together by every supporting ligament, and you can make each part do its work. So we ask that it does in Jesus' name. And in the midst of all the pain, help us to stand strong for you. Bring us joy and peace as only you can provide. And Father, I lift up Carol to you as she is in the hospital fighting for healing of her legs. Give her courage and comfort, and may she find you in the midst of her suffering. Help her to know she is not alone and that you love her more than she knows and will walk with her through the valley to complete healing. Please lift up Bill and Vicki, guide them each and every day. Walk with them through the surgeries and healing of their bodies. Help them to know that because Jesus died on the cross for us, we can approach you in prayer with freedom and confidence to ask for healing, to not get discouraged by what doctors may say, but to believe in the report of the Lord in all things. For you are the great physician. You alone can heal us through prayer and faith believing. And thank you, Jesus, for that blessing. I thank you, Father God, for guiding and directing the lives of our children and grandchildren, for always keeping them safe and guiding them to you. I thank you for food and shelter and jobs for our homeless, that you are always with them. Guide them in your ways, Father God. As it reads in Ephesians 4, 4 and 5, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. So we thank you, Jesus, in your holy, precious name. Denise, your prayers are always a blessing for many. Perfect. So uh, we praise you and thank you. God has given you a gift. Thank you for using that to our benefit. Well, this brings us to the end of our online portion of our service today, and we thank you all for being here with us, uh, whether you're in person or online. Uh, the music that I've curated for this week in here, you're going to find a link in the notes. Um, some of this is new music, so you may not have heard these before, but please, uh, hopefully the words will speak to you, and the music will speak to your heart, and uplift you today. Uh, let us go to God in prayer. Gracious Lord God, we come before you today, and we confess here we are sinners. We're in need of your grace and mercy. We repent of our sins today, and we pray for forgiveness. We pray that by the power and the love and the blood of Jesus that we can be redeemed and made whole again with you. Lord Jesus, we ask you to come into our hearts. We make you our Lord and Savior. We thank you for your blessed assurance that we will be with you in heaven and that your spirit you will send to give us strength, hope, and love to be your disciples in this lost world. Lord, we lift up our lives to you today, our church, our city, our state, and our nation to you. We ask that you would do a mighty act of healing in us and in the world, that your word and your name would be boldly proclaimed, and that your works would be done. Embolden us today to step up and step out. Bring home the lost. Lead us to growth in your spirit and help us and keep us unto you. In your precious name we pray today. Amen. Amen.